Hey, hey, this is TJ Murphy, and welcome to another episode of Adventurous Entrepreneurs. My guest today is Claire Chandler. Claire is the driving force behind Talent Boost and boasts over a quarter century of expertise in people leadership, human resources, and business strategy. With a knack for aligning HR and business leaders, Claire is on a mission to accelerate business growth by cutting through corporate clutter and bridging organizational divides. Recognized for her unique approach to assessing and accelerating growth readiness, Claire's mastery extends to organizational design, executive coaching, and performance acceleration. Educated at prestigious institutions like Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations and the New Jersey Institute of Technology, she's not only a seasoned consultant, but also a celebrated author with several books on leadership and business strategy. Just a few of the golden takeaways Claire shares in this episode are the importance of leadership in shaping company culture, why authenticity and vulnerability are keys to effective leadership, how to be intentional in hiring, and three pillars for business success. So without further ado, this is me and Claire Chandler. Welcome to the Adventurous Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, TJ Murphy. Since quitting my corporate nine to five and starting a business while backpacking through Asia back in early 2017, I've had the privilege of learning from some incredibly adventurous entrepreneurs. Through these conversations and my own journey, I've learned that much like in life, entrepreneurship is an adventure. On this podcast, I explore the journeys of top performing leaders in their fields. These wide ranging conversations include tactical business advice, how I built this insights, lessons in leadership, life hacks, travel stories, favorite hobbies, and insights into living a purposeful and joy-filled life. Adventures await us, so let's dive in. Hey, Claire, welcome to Adventurous Entrepreneurs. Thanks, TJ. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation. And I'd love to start with just a bit of background on the journey. So Claire, can you share with us a pivotal moment in your career, or some moment in your career that really helped shape your approach to leadership and business strategy? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm a self-professed corporate survivor. I uh, spent the, the bulk of my career after, by the way, swearing I was never going to work in corporate America. That was just not my my upbringing or, or kind of my frame of reference. But you know, I graduated college. That's where the opportunities were. Um, and in 2011, I was uh, on an executive track. I was vice president of human resources in a in a large global um, organization. And you know the drill. If you've come from corporate or you've interacted with corporate, um, you know I was going 150 miles an hour. I was traveling three weeks out of four. Um, I had the privilege of leading a really great, talented team and working with a bunch of amazing people. Um, and one day while I was traveling, got a bit of a health scare and, you know, that led to some tests and I got diagnosed with cancer. And so I went from 150 miles an hour, traveling all the time, learning a lot, being really stretched to, I have to deal with this. I have to take time off of work. Um, so I went from 150 miles an hour to zero. I took a month off. I had surgery, follow-up treatment, et cetera. Um, fast forward to today, I'm cancer free. So that's not where the story is heading. Thank yeah, you for no. that. Um, but it really, that was the pivotal moment for me. That was what split my, my life and my story into before and after. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when I, when I went from 150 miles an hour to zero and I had nothing to do but heal in that time that I was off work post-surgery, um, not even, I didn't even check email for the first three weeks that I was out, which was unheard of for me. Yeah. Um, and in that time of silence and healing, I finally couldn't outrun that voice in my head that had been trying to ask me for far too long, are you doing what you're passionate about? And I had to admit that even though I love the team that I was leading and the people that I worked with, what I was doing was not lighting me up. And I, and I learned that when you have an answer like that to that question, you have to do something with it. And so that was the pivotal moment. That was the catalyst for me to, to, to get healthy, to finish my healing, to go back to work, 
um, and then really to negotiate my my release. So it was, you know, it was not a two week notice kind of thing. I had worked for the company for close to 15 years. Um, so I actually stayed on for several months. Um, but that really propelled me um, away from that sort of corporate bubble, that corporate cocoon, you know, the devil, you know, and all of those those memes, right? Um, yeah. Into this beautiful unknown of my entrepreneurial journey. Wow, what an inspiring story. And it's so refreshing to hear that, well, not only did you take the time, but you were able to take that time to really heal. <laughs> Email probably would have been detrimental to that process. So being able <laughs> to turn it all off and then in the process, really figuring out that there's a crossroads that you were coming up to. And at that moment, it became clear that your drive, your passion was going to take you down a different path. And a big theme that that we usually end up having conversations around on this podcast because of the type of people that we bring in is this idea of designing your life. And when you're in business, designing your business around the life that you ultimately want to live and the impact that you want to have. And it sounds like that terrible moment and congratulations for, for being a champion and, and kicking cancer in the butt took you down, down that path where you've been able to design that life and that business. So can you give us a little bit of context on what you're focused on today here in, gosh, now we're in September of 2023. What, what do you yeah, got? Yeah, crazy. Um, so, so this month actually marks the 10th year that I have been in business. So while this um, cancer diagnosis and my departure from corporate happened in 2011, it took me two years to really sort of figure out um, of all the things that I could do out of my own to build a business around and kind of build a brand around. Um, I, I wouldn't say I made missteps, but I certainly kind of took a circuitous route. Mm -hmm. For those in your audience who are entrepreneurs who who didn't really have a plan, and I certainly did not have a plan, I just knew that what I was doing was not the path I wanted to continue on. Um, and so I wanted to change that path, that path as quickly as possible. Um, but because I didn't have a plan, I didn't have, you know, clients lined up to work with me, I didn't really have my niche figured out. It took me two good quality years to, to really sort of hone in. Yeah. Um, and so my my brand, my focus, my niche, is really to primarily help businesses, uh, larger businesses, but really businesses of any size, um, expand without losing their best talent. Because unfortunately, I've seen I've seen it done wrong. Um, I've lived it. Uh, I, I've seen what happens when you know when cultures drive out um, the people that they absolutely need to achieve their mission. And so it's my mission to help businesses to do that a different way. I love it. And you, in my research, I came across this tidbit that some of your best clients call you their their therapist. So <laughs> I'm curious what what that dynamic looks like. And can you recall a particularly challenging session that led to some breakthrough results for that client? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, in the in the earlier days when I was uh, kind of uh, really dialing into my to my niche, I kind of got um, I got really good at talking to people and interviewing them for for different things, whether it was to kind of help them get out of their own way, uh, whether it was a group coaching dynamic or more of a, you know, I want to pull out your um, your core DNA and help you kind of build your employer brand around that. Um, and I started to get a reputation that people felt um, comfortable enough with me to be so vulnerable that often they would they would cry, not sob, but like, you know, get get emotional because you know, my my job is really to um, not figure out the answers for you, but pull those answers out of you, right? Whether it's your brand, whether it's your, um, you know, your employee value proposition, um, whether it's the right structure within your people organization or your broader business to really support um, the fulfillment of your mission. Um, and over time, I've gotten um, the, the great privil privilege to work with a lot of executives, in particular in, in HR, kind of funny how it, it all kind of came full circle. Um, and most HR executives, like any executive, if you looked at their calendar, you would cry because the amount of meetings and commitments oh, no. and appointments they have from the moment they wake up in the morning to the moment they, they collapse in bed at night um, is staggering. And so they don't really have a lot of free time to 
strategize, to build a stronger culture, to motivate their team. And that's part of the problem, right? And so invariably they will call me um, either early in the morning before they start to tackle their, their to-do list or more typically on their drive home at night. And so there, there were a couple in particular that as we started to, to um, kind of build up our relationship and, and, and build our chemistry and our working relationship together, um, they saw in me a kindred spirit. Right. Mm. So they they understood that I have been in their shoes. I know what they're they're tackling. And I also know a way out. Um, and so, you know, as they kind of uh, sort of use me as a sounding board a little bit and kind of open up to me in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, what's sort of standing in their way. Um, they get to a comfort level where they can take the the filters off. And I don't mean they curse like sailors. Some of them do. Don't sometimes don't get wrong, I'm sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it's called session. for, but yeah, but like really like they, they don't have to worry so much about staying on brand. They just sort of say, Claire, you know, they, like nobody gets what I'm going through. Like you do. Um, I, I, you know, I go home to my family. They don't really know the life of an HR executive. I can't admit to my team that I don't have all the answers. I can't go into the C-suite and acknowledge to the CEO, um, you know, that I'm that I'm feeling a bit vulnerable, even though we all talk a good game about the importance of vulnerability. I have a problem demonstrating that in the C-suite, in the boardroom, et cetera. But I can go to you, Claire, and I can talk to you on my ride home and I can just sort of let it out. Um, and invariably in those conversations, they will say, why does this always feel like a therapy session? And so the name kind of stuck, right? Because it's, it, I, I'm, I'm a place that they can go, first of all, to get some, some stuff done. Um, but I think even more fundamentally for them to be able to get very real about what's frustrating them so that they can move on to that important work. Yeah. And what a gift to be able to come to that table from a place of experience where you do get it. Like you're not just therapizing, but you've been on the other side and, and come out the other end. So I'm sure that is a tremendous gift. And I want to dig into something you talked about, which was culture, because for these HR leaders that have a calendar that would make me cry, like you said, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of work that needs to be done from building that culture within your own day-to-day -day first and foremost, so that you can lead by example. How do you help your, your clients really get it when it comes to culture and how that can drive business growth. But but more importantly, how does it start from that singular focus? How, how can you lead by example when it comes to culture and ultimately build that into your teams? Yeah. So it, 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 it's interesting, you know, the, the word culture has been kind of thrown around for years now, um, primarily from the HR corner of the office. Mm -hmm. And it has largely been met by other business leaders as um, a nice to have. Right. The culture is this sort of squishy HR term, kind of like employee engagement. And they're all, you know, part of the same uh, whole. Right. Um, I deeply believe that culture is foundational, that the culture that you build or at least the culture that you have will make or break your business. And I think a lot of leaders um, mistakenly believe, first of all, that culture is just a nice to have. So that's myth number one that I would love to bust. And it's part of my part of my mission to bust that. Um, but two, that culture just sort of bubbles up from the ground level, that it just kind of happens organically. And then it's really an expression of the boots on the ground workforce. And in fact, the opposite is true. Um, in my experience, the, the biggest impact on the culture of a company is the behavior of the leaders. The leaders shape the culture of a company. And the culture, as I said, can make or break your business. So it is really important that um, every business leader at every level of an organization, but not just in the HR shop, truly understand and embrace their, their duty to shape culture in a positive direction. Because when you have toxic culture, when you have culture that is built on mistrust, when you have a blaming culture, when you have a culture that does not, um, that is not inclusive in the best possible sense of that word, right? Um, you're not going to attract the right talent. You're not going to be able to retain them. And you're certainly not going to be able to motivate them to come together to achieve your shared mission. And so culture is absolutely foundational in the business. And it is at the core of what I do when I serve those clients. 
Would you say that it, it's a common misconception that you see that people think they can just, they bring in the right people. If you build it, they will come. And, and that's what culture really is driven from. Yeah. So you're stumbling upon another myth um, yeah. or not even stumbling upon it, but you're, but you're hitting upon it. Um, which is if I just hire the best rock stars in the industry, I'm going to, you know, just get out of their way. They're going to know what to do and they're going to make magic. Um, and again, the opposite is true. If you're not intentional about focusing on bringing in the right talent to help achieve your mission, then you are very likely going to blow up your business. I've seen it happen too often that people get enamored with, um, you know, either pilfering from their competitors or just seeing somebody who is just killing it out in the industry and saying, we want that person in our, you know, on our team and as part of our culture. And if they don't do the due diligence through the screening process, through the interviewing, through, um, you know, trying to help them make connections with other people that they are going to work with on a day-to-day -day basis, if they don't get the chemistry right, and they don't ensure that that person is the right talent to bring into the team and to help strengthen the culture and to strengthen what's already built. They will, in fact, e erode the culture that they've already got and blow up their business. So it is really, really important for leaders to understand that there is a very fundamental difference between looking for the best talent and bringing on board the right talent. Yeah. And I think it sounds like it really starts with taking a look in the mirror first and doing that work, also designing how you want that culture to look, what are the steps, what are the the fundamental practices within the organization that are going to make that happen. So I guess I'm my next question would be, I'm curious that in that process of, of growing a business and building a culture on purpose, rather than just building something, bringing in people and, and hoping that it'll all fall into place, what are common obstacles that you see people run into and, and how do you help them overcome them or how have you seen people overcome them in those types? So, of so I don't know if this is coincidental or you're just a really good researcher before you did this interview, but that's one of my taglines is growing on purpose. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that you already, that you already went there. Yeah. Um, I think something one of the I use a lot too, designing, yeah, designing your it, life so, on you purpose to, right? rather than reacting yeah. to what the world throws at you. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, I think to, to kind of get to the heart of your question, like what's one of the biggest obstacles? One of the things that I have seen um, repeat itself over and over to the detriment of a lot of companies is there's kind of a, a, a serious disconnect between how um, HR leaders in an organization and then by extension, their team approach business. And, and, and that is not to pick on HR because I think HR uh, largely gets stereotyped as being out of touch with business, not understanding, you know, the financial side, um, how the business actually runs, but really the core of the disconnect is a little bit different. So when you talk to business leaders outside of HR, the first place that they're going to focus is on performance, right? Mm -hmm. They're looking at bottom line performance. They're looking at the numbers and listen, if you don't hit your numbers quarter after quarter, year after year, you're going to go out of business ultimately. Exactly. Um, so from the CEO, the COO, the CFO, their first focus is bottom line performance. And there's a strong argument for doing that. The problem is the HR folks come into the room and the first lens that they apply to any situation in business is a people lens. And rightly so, that's why they're there. They are there to bring in the right talent in the right way, give them the right support and tools and motivation and you know clarity to, um, to achieve the role that you've defined for them. But because they're starting from different lenses, there is already a built-in disconnect between yeah. how most leaders approach the business climate and how an HR leader approaches it. One is from performance, one's from people. And then what ends up happening is that divide gets worse over time because both areas of the business are now, um, you know, sort of tasked with and have to put in processes that replicate best practices and engineer out inefficiencies. But if some of the leaders are applying those processes from a performance lens and some of them are applying them from a people lens, their processes are going to be out of alignment. And so that disconnect gets wider. And, and you see this in a natural tension between finance and HR, between, you know, the operations folks who are trying to deliver on what the marketing and sales folks folks promise to the marketplace. Um, 
those disconnects only get worse and worse if they continue to um, just apply their lens without respecting and sort of acknowledging the other lenses. This is one of the main reasons that silos form. There are other reasons as well, but that's one of the main reasons that these rifts or these disconnects happen. And so to come back to the phrase that you and I both love, which is growth on purpose, if you think about performance and you think about people and you think about process as the three circles in a Venn diagram, the sweet spot in the middle of that is purpose. And so the best way to overcome that obstacle of that disconnect of silos of, you know, developing processes and systems that are uh, at cross purposes is to reacquaint yourself from a leadership level with why you were in business to begin with. Um, to riff on Simon Sinek for a minute, you know, he's a great thought leader in the space of the concept of starting with why. And his premise is quite simple, right? That every business knows what they are in business, um, what they produce or what they do. Most of them should anyway, know how they go about delivering that product or that service. But really it's, it's only the ones that stand out and differentiate themselves from their competitors that start first with why they're in business in the first place. And so I challenge any business and any leader to reacquaint themselves with why they're in business to start with and to get everybody in that leadership room dialed into that purpose first so that then when they apply the lenses of what does performance need to look like, who is the right talent to come in and help us achieve that purpose, and what are the processes that when we work together and blend people and performance are actually going to help us scale and replicate success and not keep repeating the sins of the past, well, now you're off to the races. Yeah. You literally read my mind when you said Simon Sinek, because as you were saying that, I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to get into the why conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, we we hear this a lot about purpose and leading with purpose. And especially as you start to grow and are leading teams at scale, everybody has a different objective. Well, one objective, but they have different lenses, like you said. So I love that you bring up the importance of as the leader, as the CEO, or you know, even as an HR leader, needing to get everybody bought in and seating, sitting at the table to talk about that common purpose. And if it's something that's gotten lost along the way, you know, it's probably time to to really reorganize and figure out what that why is, what the purpose, and get everybody aligned on that so that with their individual lenses, they can always use that as the guiding compass and focus on Absolutely. purpose first. Anything within that, because you know we can talk about it theor theoretically, but is there any process or, or literature or, or anything that you point people to that are missing that piece to be able to, to get that and start weaving it into their organization? Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, the foundation of that, if, if your audience, the leaders, the businesses do nothing else, it's to re-clarify um, the purpose of the business, and they go one step further from that, which is what is the purpose of their leadership role? Mm -hmm. um, I think too often you you leave a leader in their role long enough, they're going to forget why they were put there. And they're going to start to get enamored with the trappings of leadership versus the obligation that they have to move the business forward. And to do that in a way that um, doesn't burn out their people, but actually invests in their resources, their greatest resources, which is the human capital. Um, one of the things that I do with, with my clients is take them through a framework, which I've named growth on purpose. So you're going to love that. All right. Um, yes, and it's, a, it yeah, so it's, it's this kind of nine, nine part framework and it's, it's broken down into three main pillars. Um, and depending on where a company is, they may not have to start it at zero, right? They certainly should start with clarifying their, their purpose from, from the very top, right? The reason it's called growth on purpose is because you got to start with, you know, what is that horizon that you're striving for? Um, and again, I think too many businesses kind of lose sight of that. And they're just, they're just kind of not going through the motions, but they're going through automations um, and not good ones, not the ones that are going to help you scale, but they're the ones that, that make you start to sleepwalk through your business. And they just sort of do what they've always done. Right. Um, so the framework starts from step zero, really, which is let's absolutely get dialed in and be crystal clear on what it is that we are here to accomplish. And then the three pillars are 
um, awareness, acceleration, and alignment. And awareness starts with awareness of self. So every single person in an organization, especially the top leaders, and I'm including the CEO in this, they have to be deeply self-aware of what they bring to the table and what they lack. Um, and there are ways you can do this. I'm not gonna bore you with all the methodology, but that pillar is really intended to um, heighten the self-awareness of every individual in the organization to understand why they're there in the first place, the strengths they bring to the table and the blind spots they might have, which should motivate them to lean on the people around them. Because I think too often we, we sort of um, get paratrooped into a role and we think, okay, I have to come up with all of these answers myself. I see this so often with new leaders that are put into a bigger role. Um, and there's this sort of um, self-imposed expectation that they can't ask for help mm. and that they have to figure out everything themselves. And it only gets worse the higher up the, the leadership ladder they go. So this awareness pillar Vulnerability is really, being the yeah, key. Yeah, huge, there. right? Um, and we could go down the, the Brene Brown rabbit hole, another mm -hmm. brilliant, brilliant thought leader. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like if, if, if we don't get back to um, getting really, really clear on, you know, what is it we're good at and what is it we're not? Because we can't be good at everything. We don't have all the answers. And there's a reason that there's a team and, and you know, tools and processes around us to help support our success. So awareness is key, awareness of self. That second pillar around acceleration um, is around a key part of acceleration, which is acceleration of trust. Trust is, um, if culture is foundational to your business, trust is foundational to culture, right? If your people don't trust you as leaders, they are not gonna follow you. They may do just enough not to get fired until they can find a different gig or maybe yeah. even go out on their own because that's certainly a trend, right? Um, and so it's really important that you have um, an environment and a framework and a, and a discipline around authenticity and genuine leadership and yes, vulnerability, mm -hmm. so that your people understand that you get that you're not perfect because your people already know that, that you don't have all the answers and that working together with clarity of purpose and awareness of self, we can now work on the bigger problems in the business. And so there are ways through this framework that we can accelerate the buildup of trust through making sure that there are authentic interactions between teams and their leaders so that they can have the real conversations that overcome obstacles and get the work done. So that's pillar two. And then pillar three is, is alignment. And alignment is also key because it's alignment on what matters. So again, if we start with clarifying purpose, we build up that awareness of self, we accelerate trust and kind of, you know, heighten those team dynamics. Now we can really get aligned on the things that are going to move the needle toward our mission, right? And those are things like strategic alignment, like integrating cultures as we grow, like getting teams together in a more transparent way so they can actually build up the roadmaps between where we are today and where we're trying to get to as a business, as a culture, as a team, as an industry. Um, and so when you put all those three pillars together, when done right, you can actually grow on purpose. Um, and so for your audience, you might think that's, that's a lot, that's very overwhelming. Yep. Not everybody's yeah. starting from zero, right? And so one of the things that I typically will do with a client is say, let's just kind of take a pulse check on where you are right now, because you might be really strong in some of those, those areas. And so we don't have to focus so much on those. We may just need to validate for you that, that this is a strength for you as an example. So keep your foot on the gas, right? But there might be some other areas of real vulnerability in, in your business that we want to make sure we pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that point, too, because when you look at everything, it can be certainly overwhelming. But depending on the season that you're in, in your organization, in your business, there's probably a lot more need in certain of those pillars. You know, you, you might need to focus on pillar three right now versus pillar one or pillar two. So that's right. I'm guessing this is something that is accessible to folks in some way, shape or form. Is this in your books? Is this a ebook it's, of some sort? How, how can people learn more about it? Yeah. So it's, it's on my, uh, it's on my website and we will uh, drop the link. I'm sure in the, in the, yes. in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so, um, your audience, anybody listening to this conversation can go to my website and download. There's a, like a one page, 
um, almost placemat really of the growth yeah. on, on purpose yeah. framework. Um, so they can check that out, download it for free um, and start applying it to their business right away. Awesome. Well, we will include the link in the show notes. And at this point in the conversation, I want to segue a little bit. And one of the things that I dug up in my research is that you've been described as being always calm in a crisis. That is a, is a killer attribute and a, a mighty fine compliment for someone to give. And I'm curious if there's anything there. So how do you maintain composure and, and clarity in what are you know seemingly very challenging situations or overwhelming situations? Yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, because there's a there's a fine line you have to walk between staying calm in the midst of somebody else's chaos, um, yeah. but also bringing the energy, right? And 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 showing your your passion for what you do. Um, I think when 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 people when I get to to work with different clients, and I and I I really am fortunate because I work with some amazing companies um, and some really inspiring leaders, um, and so I'm I'm always humbled by that opportunity, right? Um, but when I get to to interact with them, when I'm in a room full of leaders, um, they can't help but notice that I bring the energy because I love working with them and I love what I do. And I think that is part of the reason I can be their calm through their storm and through their their chaos. Yeah. Um, one, because I've been through it myself. Right. I am a corporate survivor. Um, two, because I'm also a cancer survivor, it kind of puts into perspective some of the day to day. Yeah. yeah. Like there's, there's a lot of day to day BS, right. That we, that we over index on and make a bigger deal than it is. Um, and because of that, we create so much noise for ourselves that we often miss what really is a crisis in the making. And so for me to kind of come into, a, into the middle of a room like that and understand the storm that they are um, in the midst of, but not jump in, you know, to, to uh, try to save them if they're in choppy water, but really be part of, you know, the, the, I don't mean to, I'm going to now beat this analogy to death, but what just kind of like popped up for me is I want to be their lighthouse. I don't want to be mm -hmm. the life raft that they swamp. Right. Okay. Um, and part of the way to do that is, is for me to kind of stay a little bit above the fray. And for me to constantly check in with them and with myself to say, what are we ultimately trying to achieve, right? What is that purpose? Or at least what is that shorter term horizon that we're trying to get to? Um, what I often find happens is we are so in the middle of our own forest. And you talk to anybody who's in corporate, especially, and they will constantly describe their days as firefighting. Um, you know. It, it, like I said about the calendar, it can get very overwhelming, but even just getting pulled into the tactical every single day. Um, and part of the way that I bring that sense of calm is to help them get dialed back into their purpose and then help them kind of break down, um, you know, what they're trying to do in a way where it can, it will make their decisions a lot easier. So another um, resource that we'll drop in the show notes and your audience can go and grab for free is what I call the decision dashboard. Um, and so this is a resource that um, really kind of walks them step by step through, you know, again, kind of calibrating or, or reconnecting with what your purpose or your mission is, and then understanding what are the fundamentals required to get there. And it kind of walks you through this methodology to, um, you know, to, to break that down into much easier decisions because I think a lot of leaders, a lot of businesses get kind of hung up on the decision making. And because they don't have all the information they need to make a sound decision, they tend to delay the decision. And paralysis well, that's a problem. analysis. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. So there's, you know, it if if through working with me or even just unloading on me in one of our leadership therapy sessions, therapy they can sessions. get to that point <laughs> of clarity. Yeah. Like it just yep. it will help them, right? Because they just sort of understand in in the midst of the swirl, What's the one decision I need to make right now? What's one action I can take? And it doesn't have to be a huge action. Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's let's just take one decision and act upon that and then reevaluate and reassess and keep moving forward. I love that. And I love the analogy because as leaders, we all need a lighthouse to cut through the fog, to cut through the darkness. We don't 
always need a life raft thrown our way. We need something to really get that clarity. So that can be someone like working with Claire Chandler. That could be a framework that you use. There's different ways to accomplish that at different points. And, you know, depending on the the degree of complexity and, and the problems you're dealing with, there's probably different tools for, for each time. But we're definitely going to put the link to the decision dashboard in the show notes. And I'm excited to check that out. So Claire, this is a podcast about entrepreneurship, but one of the biggest hurdles that we all face, but certainly as entrepreneurs is living a well-rounded life, doing the things that bring us joy with the people that we care about most. And so this is a question that I always like to ask because it's near and dear to me. What does living a well-rounded life look like for you? And how do you blend what I'm sure is a very busy schedule and, and you do a lot of impactful work with people. How do you make that work with what is important to you, your family, your friends, your you time, whatever it might be? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I love that. Cause it is so it's, it's so important, right. To, to have a well-balanced life, um, you know, to, to focus on your health. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I have personal experience to know like your health has to come first. Cause if you, if you don't have that, um, it doesn't matter how passionate you are about the, the business you're trying to build. Um, I it, more recently, so first of all, I'm not a morning person and I'm not an exercise nut. So I have friends who are like, oh, you know, I feel I feel like such an underachiever. I only ran three miles this morning. I'm like, like, <laughs> I don't dog. even know who you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like that's so that's not me. But, um, you know, relatively recently, I've, I, I kind of recommitted to um, not getting healthy, but being more well-rounded. And so I, not a morning person, I get up a half an hour earlier. Um, I go for a walk. I, uh, I, like the, I like the feel of a physical book, but I've gotten hooked on podcasts, obviously, yeah, um, audible, you know, audiobooks. And so my motivation for actually either hitting the treadmill or going for a walk for a half an hour is to listen to a business book. And so I start my day, um, you know, not watching mindless television or doom scrolling, although sometimes yeah. I fall prey to that or watching no, we news, all, we yeah, all like all this yep. crap, right? <laughs> um, I try to feed my mind a little bit. And so I'll do that for, you know, half an hour. Um, I'll also then, you know, spend a little bit like I'll, I'll have I'll have a decent breakfast um, and then I'll do some like reflecting, um, you know, whether that's to kind of frame my day. Uh, might read some some spiritual you know reflections that sort of thing just to kind of get my my mind centered um and so you know it, it's sort of the the mind body spirit right mm -hmm. so the exercise is, is for nourishing the body um you know my my spirit kind of that reflection the business uh the business book that i listen to is my mind um also you know make sure that i that i eat a breakfast so nourish the body too but um all of that helps me to start my day not jumping into the middle of the firefight. I kind of trained myself a while ago. Um, I don't look at my email until at least nine in the morning, um, unless there's like a strong compelling reason. Like I'm on site with a client or I know I'm gonna be booked the rest of the day and I wanna just kind of see what's what's sort of there. Um, but I find that if you, if the first thing you do when the alarm goes off is reach over for your phone, which I know is right on your nightstand and you open your email, you surrender control to what's waiting for you there. And the rest of your day is just reactive. Um, and so I learned, I kind of trained myself and I really feel like this has been one of the keys to, to having a, a more well-balanced life and by extension, a well-balanced business um, is, to, is to preserve, yes, my sanity, but to preserve that balance and not to um, not let the emails that are waiting for me dictate the impact I'm going to make. Yeah. And it all really boils into this theme of, of this episode being on purpose, doing things on purpose when you're feeding your mind to start the day rather than reaching for your phone or jumping on email. The first thing you do when you get into work, which then immediately, as you said, becomes reactive mode. You're dealing with everyone else's to-do lists and problems rather than what's important to you. When you can structure your day, especially in the morning, even for people that aren't morning people, you know, <laughs> having those little changes, getting up slightly earlier, actually putting your phone in the bathroom so you can't even grab it first thing, maybe grab the book instead. All of these little changes 
are very attainable. And even if you are somebody that's stuck into the email first thing in the morning mode, there are tools that you can use. You can pause your inbox now, which is an amazing tool that I've found and, and utilize frequently, even in the middle of the day. If I'm going into deep work mode, I got to get rid of that distraction completely. So pausing the inbox, closing that tab out, making it very hard for myself to even have that option of checking my email has been you know, really empowering, giving me a lot more of my time back. And I appreciate you bringing that up because it's something I hear time and time again now from successful entrepreneurs is just having that rule built in where you don't check email until 9 or 10 a.m. or whatever that timeline looks like for you, but using that time instead to feed your mind and to work on the things that are actually going to move the needle forward for you and for your business. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I have a choose your own adventure question, which I teed up Ooh. at the beginning of the call. And this will be our, our segue to wrapping up here. So you can pick which one you'd like to answer or, or both if you so desire. But the first would be, what's your favorite place you visited recently, say the last five, 10 years, or what is a recent adventure that you went on? And in either case, what was it like? What made it so memorable? Maybe a lesson you learned, a favorite meal or drink you had, the people that you were with. Give us a story. Oh my gosh, there's there, there's so many ways that I could answer that. Um, so since you went back to 10 years, so it, not only is this month my 10 year business anniversary, it's my 10 year wedding anniversary. Um, I probably should have mentioned that in the same sentence with my business. I did not mean to, <laughs> to, to suggest that one was more important than the other. Um, but we went on our honeymoon to Curacao and um so we're we're coming up to our 10 year anniversary and we're talking about my husband and i were talking about a trip and so my passport was about to expire so it's with the federal government right now and so i don't know when i'm getting it back because you have to mail it it's a whole oh, it's a whole, whole thing. process is stupid yeah. but anyway so i won't have it in time to go to to go to curacao um so we're going to go somewhere domestically i'll come back to to where that is because you're going to you're going to want to know this um but earlier this year my husband, who still works for the French company where he and I met, um, mm. got an opportunity to go to Paris. And I haven't been to Paris since before COVID. But when I worked there uh, for the same French company, I, I went there quite often. And I, it's just one of my favorite cities. Um, and so I, being an entrepreneur, having my own business, I had the flexibility to kind of move things around. And so he didn't even get the words out that he would have to be in Paris on such and such dates. I said, I'm going with you. Yeah. Um, and while he was in conference rooms and meetings with his with his team, you know, for for all hours of the day, um, I was let loose on the city. And so my routine was to walk quite a bit. Uh, I bought new sneakers, had not broken them in. So I went to, you know, uh, French pharmacies and through my really, really bad French had to ask for band-aids and shoals cushions oh, no. and all of that because <laughs> just destroyed my feet. But it was so well worth it. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to spend time reacquainting myself with the city, walking for miles, um, eating, you know, just tremendous food, uh, enjoying just amazing wine and, and just, you know, standing, standing in cathedrals and museums, um, that are older than our country by a lot yeah. is so humbling. And so, you know, the very first time I ever went to, to Paris and stood um, in one of the cathedrals, I just broke down crying because I was so overcome by the beauty of it, the majesty of it, and just the, the history. Um, and so getting to, to reconnect with that, um, uh, earlier this, this year was great. Um, but I do want to mention to you where we're going to go to celebrate our 10, 10th anniversary, because you mentioned to me before we started recording that you're from Oregon. Yes. Um, yep. And Here so in beautiful Bend, Oregon. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So my husband and I are, uh, red wine drinkers and our favorite wine region is Willamette Valley. Yes. Um, Will Willamette is how we pronounce it here in Oregon, but Willam. Willamette. All right, there. Willamette. Well, yeah. Ah, see, okay. Now I have yeah. a little local tip. It's like, so this it's like the o Oregon versus Oregon. Got it. Got it. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to be going there. Um, we haven't booked the trip yet. Hopefully by the time this airs, we will already have gone and, and come back. But, um, but that is the trip that is waiting us. And I am super excited to go and. Oh, it's and a beautiful, the, the wine. Yeah. Beautiful part of the state and amazing wines. Yeah. I was, I was just in Eugene this past weekend as I was sharing mm -hmm. with you. And mm -hmm. yeah, when I was going to school there, 
um, once I was old enough anyway, of age, I definitely loved going out to, to the wineries and there's countless to choose from. So you guys, I know you're that's going to be the biggest time. problem is narrowing it down, but I think yes. we're up to the challenge. So <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, I'm excited to, to hear all about that trip and have an amazing time here in Oregon. So as we part here, Claire, do you have any ask, uh, parting advice, words of wisdom, anything at all that you want to give our listeners before we wrap things up? Yeah, so I definitely, uh, first of all, thank you again for for having me on your show. I've I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I, you know, I I do encourage your your listeners to to reach out. Um, they can check out the the links that we're going to drop in the show notes. Um, if they want to learn more about my work, they can go to ClaireChandler.net or my company uh, website, which is talentboost.net. But it's really just to come back to um, wherever you are in your journey, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're in corporate and have no intention of, of going out on your own, it doesn't matter. Um, listen to that voice inside your head. Mm -hmm. if, if you decide that you're not doing what you're passionate about, it does not necessarily mean you have to walk out of corporate like I did. It just might mean you need to reconnect with your own purpose. But do that. Be intentional about that. The payoff is huge. And don't wait another minute. Mm, I love it. Live life on purpose, folks. That's what it's all about. We only get this one shot. So we'll drop links to all of your socials, website, these amazing resources you gave us. And I appreciate you joining me on the show, Claire. This has been a lot of fun. And enjoy your time here in Oregon, sipping Pinot Noir and all of the <laughs> oh, yeah. wonderful wines that we have. <laughs> Thank you. I cannot wait. To all of our adventurous listeners, thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please be sure to subscribe, download, and share this on social media or with someone you know will get some value from it. Leaving a review goes a long way in helping people find the show. And I personally appreciate reading them when they come in. So please go drop one if you have the time. We'll see you all next week. And remember, whether we're talking about business or the things that bring us joy outside of work, life is meant for exploring. So go out there and live it one adventure at a time.